up, U.S. History? Welcome back to class. Okay, so today, kind of an interesting lecture on a pretty controversial topic that probably in a lot of U.S. history classes, they wouldn't even do any kind of a lesson or lecture on this. It might just get built into uh, the curriculum that you're already covering. But I thought it was worthwhile to at least do a one-day lesson kind of recapping America's war on drugs, because that really heats up in the time period that we've just been covering, kind of the late 60s, early 1970s. Uh, but of course, like substance use and drugs in general... <clears throat> Well, those have been around. They're as old as civilization, right? And, and humans, uh, for one reason or another, are drawn to them. And different people like different kinds of substances. And some people don't use any. But it's kind of an interesting part of culture. And definitely in America, we've been... Uh, We've tried a lot of different uh, tactics or strategies, but uh, overall, I would say America is a place where a lot of American people like to cut loose and party and enjoy that stuff. And uh, there, there's been a, a lot of tension over time between like the government, the powers that be and how they try to real. Re regulate things and then the general population. So for this one, I'm not going super in depth on any particular drug or substance, but I am going to give a really quick, like in a nutshell, uh, kind of do a look at different substances and kind of the history of them uh, as it ties into to our American history class. Um, anyway, here you go. I would probably include this either in the 1970s notes if you had just started that up uh, on my last lecture. <clears throat> or it would fit in pretty good with like the civil rights notes uh, if you were just continuing onto that page. Or if you're not taking notes at all, just kick back, listen to it, and uh, hopefully there's something here that, that you can take away from it and you come away a little more knowledgeable uh, on this kind of interesting and controversial topic. So here we go. And I would put in a heading for it, America's War on Drugs. I'm not going to have any, I don't really plan to have any uh, exam questions on this, but there might be a couple quiz questions, and I'll kind of highlight that information when we get to it uh, that would tie into the upcoming quiz. So <clears throat> going back into time, now a lot of us would not think of alcohol as a drug. Usually when you say drugs, uh, modern you know, Americans would think of like heroin, cocaine, maybe marijuana, but pills, that kind of stuff. However, I think it's very important to point out that alcohol is absolutely a drug. Uh, tobacco is a drug. Even like, hey, I'm sitting here drinking coffee right now. I swear there's no whiskey in that, but I'm drinking my coffee. Caffeine is a drug. Uh, so really, you know, if you're you're looking at it technically, there's a whole lot of things that anything that kind of impacts your, your mood uh, or even things like Tylenol would technically, that's considered a drug too, even though it doesn't alter your state of mind. Now, uh, we usually, when we talk about drugs as a problem, we think of like the heroin and overdoses or methamphetamines, things like that. But without a doubt, if you go look at stats, uh, alcohol is the drug that has caused more pain and suffering, causes more deaths than any other drug by far. Uh, but the thing is, we don't usually think of alcohol necessarily as a drug because it's a socially acceptable one. And it's one that is has the longest history in America uh, of being kind of socially acceptable and used. Now, if you go back into time, even before what, the time period we started covering in class, like going back to the 1800s, uh, the time period Fry was covering in eighth grade, Americans have long loved their whiskey and their boozes and, you know, liquors and beers, okay? I, one thing that always stuck out in my head was a, I forget the guy's name, but he was a Frenchman that came over a little bit after the time of the American Revolution. This was like early 1800s. And one of the takeaways uh, he took from his time visiting around and traveling the country was that, my God, they're a nation of drunkards. And he talked and went on about how much the Americans have an appetite for whiskey and that, man, they, you know, Fr the French drink a lot of wine too. And the British like their, their ales and beers and stuff. But, uh, but I guess Americans, uh, we kind of took it to a new level and we, uh, you know, the, on the one hand, there has always been a lot of pushback from like the religious community. So kind of a key part here, there's been this like psychological tension in America between our ethics, our morals, our religion, 
uh, all of that stuff, which generally in Christianity, uh, it, it's even though Jesus did turn water into wine and uh, it, it isn't expressly condemned and it doesn't say you can't drink alcohol, you're supposed to drink it in moderation. So on the one hand, you have like the temperance movement, which is like self-control and morals and be a good religious person. On the other hand, um, a lot of Americans have this really strong draw to like We work hard, we're productive, but we also play hard. We like to cut loose and have fun too. So that dynamic has been playing out. I think you see it today, but it's been true throughout American history. Uh, In America, it's not like uh, drinking only did an uptick in, say, since the time of Prohibition or in the 60s or 70s or today. Uh, We actually, on average, consume far less alcohol as Americans in general today than we did uh, about 150 years ago. If you go back to the 1800s, Uh, check out this stat. Like, I think this is accurate. I've heard it cited uh, several different times when I've been kind of researching this subject. But you go back to the 1800s, I guess on average, the American men drank about one pint of whiskey a day. Now, when you stop and think about that, consider that because a pint a day, that's a fair amount. That's enough to give, you know, an adult man a pretty good buzz. Uh, But you also have to factor in that there were hundreds of thousands, millions of men that didn't drink at all. So to get an average like that, that means that the people that are drinking are actually probably drinking more like a fifth of whiskey or so a day. That's an incredible amount of alcohol being consumed uh, to get an average like that. And actually, that number has tapered off over time. Um, but I guess back in the 1800s, a lot of people, you know, there wasn't as much entertainment out there. Uh, boredom was more of a thing. So a lot of times after you get done with a long, hard day, you know, at the office, or more likely back in that time, it would be at the farm or in the factory. Uh, A lot of guys would cut loose and go and party and drink it up and and hit the local saloon uh, and have some whiskey or some beer. Now, we covered this way back in uh, like quarter two. We talked about the time of prohibition. I guess uh, late 1800s on through to the early 1900s, alcohol was increasingly seen as a problem. Those alcohol rates were on the incline. Uh, Of course, that can be a really destructive thing to families. So the temperance movement, which is like kind of largely religious based, but it was, uh, it's all about self-control and moderation. Uh, If you hear of the temperance movement in American history, it's really kind of the anti-alcohol movement, the the group that was trying to get prohibition uh, added to the constitution, get and and limit alcohol. Um, The goal, I think prohibition was absolutely a failure. I think the goal was to reduce violence, uh, to have less hungover workers, uh, especially to cut down on like domestic violence, like uh, angry drunks that would come home and and beat their kids or beat their wife. Uh, That is a legit problem. That's a really sad thing when, when that happens. And the temperance movement was trying to remedy that. And they thought by banning alcohol, well, then people wouldn't be able to drink anymore if you ban it everywhere in the country. Uh, However, we know, and we've covered this in history, so I'm not going to go into this too much here. Uh, That didn't happen. Like anytime a government tries to regulate people's like morals and ethics and personal behavior, uh, that's kind of a tricky thing because if people want to drink, Typically, what history has shown us and what the experiment with prohibition showed us was they find a way to drink whether the government says they can or not. <clears throat> now they're just going to do it illegally. So an, a big unintended consequence of prohibition. And later, I'm going to draw a direct line to the war on drugs in modern times and prohibition back 100 years ago. Uh, the consequence was it created a huge black market. Really, during prohibition, alcohol rates, mm, they came down just slightly, but not significantly at all, like you might think. Um, actually, you know, in certain areas, in certain cities where the speakeasies and the flappers and jazz clubs are, are booming, alcohol consumption went up. And now it was like, man, it's taboo. We're getting away with something. And then, of course, Probably the worst part of prohibition was it made a huge uptick in organized crimes. Guys like the dude right up here in in the photo, Al Capone, makes a killing, like literally billions of dollars in today's money uh, by locking down the Chicago market and selling uh, selling booze, selling uh, you know whiskey brought in over from Canada distilleries to uh, to the people of Chicago and Chicago. Uh, is probably the most well-known of the 
legging gangsters and was the most successful. But there was an Al Capone in pretty much every major American city. Uh, that became a big business. So think of like uh, heroin and cocaine and drugs like that today. And, you know, the, the Mexican cartels get <clears throat> brought up a ton uh, if you're watching like the evening news. And that's a really tense kind of rotten situation happening down there in Mexico with organized crime and the cartels. But really, the cartels are just a new incarnation. They're just a, a new version of Al Capone and all the bootlegging gang gangsters of back of the Prohibition era. OK, moving on now. Cannabis a.k.a. marijuana. Uh, so this is kind of an interesting one. And even though it is, this one is starting to become a more culturally acceptable one today. And there's recently been uh, pushes to kind of like decriminalize it. And like if you live in the state of Michigan, which you guys do, uh, it's been kind of legalized here. And, and we have pot shops all over the place. And you can see those. And uh, certain states now have decriminalized or, or totally legalized and uh, regulate the sale of marijuana today. Uh, but that was not true back in the era we've been covering, the 60s and 70s. It was illegal back then. Um, and uh, you know, you like today, it's kind of a weird situation in America because at the federal government level, level the national government in Washington, D.C., marijuana is still illegal. So technically, in one sense, it's still illegal here in Michigan, but the state of Michigan has has legalized it. So you have that weird dynamic where technically it's illegal everywhere in the country, according to the national government, but a lot of different state governments are, are regulating it in different ways and allowing it today. Um, now, the whole war on like marijuana specifically kind of starts back in the 1920s and 30s, back in, in that like prohibition era. Um, a interesting guy to bring up this William Randolph Hearst. I had mentioned him way back in quarter one, uh, just a little bit. Now, he is kind of, uh, he's an impressive guy, kind of an entrepreneur on one hand. He's also a guy that, man, you, there's a lot of shady stories about him. And in some ways, he was kind of crooked. Uh, now, he was very political. Um, and William Randolph Hearst, if, because you probably wouldn't remember this from the quarter one lectures, he was like the biggest newspaper man in America. And go back 100 years ago, there's no internet. We don't have television. Radio is kind of a new thing. The vast majority of Americans that want to stay tuned in and understand what's happening in the country and in the world, uh, they would read newspapers. That was how people got information back then. Well, he owns over half the or the newspaper in the country, uh, either directly or indirectly through like shell companies. So he is a very influential man. Uh, if you remember the term yellow journalism, where it's exaggerated reporting and sometimes almost like propaganda, uh, he was kind of big on that. If there was a cause he believed in, he would order all his newspapers to spin it in such a way to try to win over and convince the public. Uh, another example for you, how he had influence, go back to the Spanish-American War when uh, you know the USS Maine blew up. It was yellow journalism and the newspapers were pushing everybody to think that, hey, Spain attacked us. We have to go to war with them, even though it turns out we find out years later that really wasn't the case. But by that point, we had already kicked their butt and taken their colonies. Uh, so William Randolph Hearst, interesting guy, very, very powerful. He owns all these newspapers. Uh, newspapers are made on out of paper pulp, right? You know, you have paper mills uh, where they grind up like the shavings of the wood. And I don't know exactly the process, but essentially the paper we use today comes from trees. Well, they actually realized many years ago that you can make a, a really a more durable and kind of uh, cost efficient kind of paper uh, out of hemp. And if you don't know what hemp is, um, for a long time, hemp has been illegal in the United States. Now that federal policy has changed, but hemp is basically comes from the same family of plants as cannabis. Now, hemp does not get you high. Uh, actually, like CBD comes from hemp, uh, which, you know, that's kind of caught on as a remedy to a lot of different, uh, you know, problems out there, but it's not psychoactive. Well, hemp is also an amazing plant. It can be used for like food and they can make proteins out of it, but it's also really, really good for making rope. Uh, for a long time, the U.S. military was the number one consumer of hemp in the world, which means they would use it for rope and canvas and things like that. It would be tough. Uh, but kind of ironically, American farmers weren't allowed to grow hemp, even though it wasn't psychoactive. And it was because it got lumped together with cannabis. Now, they realized they could make a better kind of 
newspaper out of hemp. Uh, other rivals, because Hirsch did not own all of the newspapers in the country, um, were trying to get that going, actually. And, and some of them were curious and going to start experimenting with using hemp paper. Well, Hearst, because he had kind of consolidated everything he needed to produce newspapers, like Henry Ford, uh, didn't just have car companies. He also had lumber companies and he had other like uh, iron mills and things like that to produce all the stuff he needed to make his cars. Hearst was the same way and he owned paper mills and he had already invested a ton of money into creating wood wood based paper for his newspapers. Well, he didn't want to lose out on that investment and have all that money go to waste and then have to retool and buy new factories that would be processing so he starts a campaign because of that, for that financial reason, he starts a campaign to basically bash marijuana, which that's a pretty common drug today and is becoming more socially acceptable. But if you go back 100 years ago, marijuana was not really a thing yet. Now, it's been around for thousands of years, and you can find certain cultures around the world that, that did smoke and use cannabis, but it wasn't a big thing here in America. Uh, it actually first kind of it, it was used a little bit more in Mexico. Um, anyway, Hearst starts this whole propaganda campaign because he wants it to be banned and he wants to still keep his, you know, kind of monopoly on the newspapers and paper mills. Um, so he starts a campaign against marijuana, Juana. You can see this is one of the old propaganda posters that he ran, uh, where it's spelled slightly differently, but talking about the same thing. And he goes on and talks, let me move this here. Uh, uh, during drug exposure, exposure, shame, horror, despair. Now, this is showing like it kind of in a weird way. It has like syringes and needles. I think a lot of people, I'm guessing, didn't even know that you primarily are going to smoke marijuana and not like inject it into your veins. Uh, a lot of misinformation and disinformation out there on the topic. Uh, but let's <laughs> check out this down low. Yeah, so marijuana leads to weird orgies, wild parties, unleashed passions, like orgies or big sex parties, you know, I think like back in Roman times when they would have stuff like that. Now, I don't know. I, I feel like that's probably not most marijuana users are not, you know, using it with syringes and, and engaging in crazy sex parties and stuff. Uh, definitely some propaganda there, but this is very widespread and you can look up all kinds of examples of this. And basically because most people in America didn't know anything, your average American farmer living in Jackson, Michigan, probably had never really heard of marijuana. And marijuana is a slang Mexican term for cannabis. Okay, that's kind of where that comes from. Uh, but he also ties in racism into it. And he, he spins it in such a way that, you know, remember, America was overwhelmingly white at that point. Most people are of European descent, like over 80% of the country. And he uh, spins it in such a way that it's like, only blacks and Mexicans do it. And it makes them want to like rape white women. Uh, horrific things to say, very racist, also quite inaccurate, but it kind of catches on in the public. And then people demand that Congress take action. And that was when marijuana technically like became illegal. I don't have the exact year or date for you. Um, but you can definitely find that and just go Google the answers to it. So he starts this campaign and uh, really kind of for reasons of business reasons about creating hemp paper and wanting to get rid of that industry. He targets the whole family of plants and is able to get Congress to pass laws. And basically all the states follow suit and ban it and make it illegal. Uh, now, fast forward, this slide might look familiar if you've been keeping up my notes. I had already hit this one in the early 1970s uh, lecture. I'm not going to recount it all, but marijuana had already been illegal through the 1960s. 60s, okay, the counterculture, the Vietnam War, the civil rights movement, that is a crazy decade of upheaval. And now television sets are in the home, just life in general in America really changed during the 60s. And if you remember uh, some of the other terms I was giving you, like the generation gap, where old people and the younger generation don't see eye to eye, that really widens in the 60s. And marijuana catches on as kind of a pop culture drug that is embraced by, you know, the hippies and the anti war movement and the flower children that are all about peace and love, uh, marijuana is embraced by that community. Well, the older crowd, the parents, the grandparents, they look at it and are like, man, what's wrong with these kids today? And Nixon kind of preys on that. And even though uh, a full panel of doctors that he convened together said 
we don't really encourage people to use cannabis or marijuana, but it's not all that dangerous. Uh, he kind of went against the advice of that panel and steps up and really kind of amps up the war on drugs because he knows uh, increasing the penalties for substances like marijuana, uh, he was able to target and lock up a lot of his political opponents that were trying to end the Vietnam War. So some kind of shady stuff there. You think like if there's going to be a war on drugs and the government is trying to ban substances, ideally they're doing it because they want to protect the people and keep them safe. Uh, now, sometimes I think that is the case, but in the case of marijuana, I don't think even Nixon believed that it was all that dangerous. It was a political tool he could use uh, to target his enemies. So that's when penalties for drugs really start to get bumped up. Uh, you, you could get it back to about 1971, kind of the end of Nixon's first term as president. Okay. Now, another, another totally different category of drugs that also catches on at the same time because the counterculture in the 1960s, uh, I think, has a lot of unintended consequences. And, and people are just rethinking the world and like, man, maybe we don't need to go off and fight these wars just because our government says we have to do. People start questioning the government more than ever. Um, marijuana it has a big uptick. And that's when average Americans, you know, kind of know what it is. And it becomes more of a mainstream substance out there. Same is true for psychedelic, like LSD or psychedelic mushrooms. Now, those substances have been around, different psychedelics have been around basically for as long as humans have been around. Uh, a lot of interesting theories about, you know, cavemen basically doing mushrooms and that may be leading to language or, uh, you know, religious beliefs. None of that can be really proven, but I've, I've heard some really interesting anthropologists and sociologists talk about that. Anyway, regardless of that, you know, you go back to the 1930s, most people would, in America had no idea what a psychedelic is. Uh, but by the 1960s, they really start to catch on and LSD uh, begins to like mainstream. And there's guys like Timothy Leary, who had been a professor, a uh, very highly educated guy, and he like really starts to promote it and say that everybody should try this and it'll make you rethink everything. Now, psychedelics are in a category all of their own. They're not really an addictive substance. Um, no psychedelic I've ever heard of has like creates a dependency where a physical dependency or a mental one uh they what they do is they make you hallucinate uh visually like through uh what you're hearing uh all across the board it takes your brain offline and makes you it sends you to the spirit world uh i'm not encouraging anybody to do any of these but i'm just kind of factually laying it out for you that's what those do uh, and i guess a lot of people had profound experiences on LSD. Uh, it catches on in Hollywood and with musicians. Like here's a Jimi Hendrix, if you've ever heard of him, one of the greatest guitar players, if not the greatest of all time. He was very big on psychedelics and, uh, and LSD specifically. Um, so it catches on because so many celebrities are using it. And it kind of permeates into that younger generation and the counterculture. Uh, and I guess a lot of people that did have psychedelic experiences, they come out of it. It makes you kind of question authority and the way we run things. And a lot of people start to, uh, it, it fans the flames of the anti-Vietnam movement too. All right. Uh, so it becomes, those become illegal too uh, in the Nixon administration. And then penalties are stiffened up on through into like the 1980s when Ronald Reagan is president, which we haven't really got to him yet. Uh, now getting into the hard drugs, uh, heroin, cocaine, I'm talking about those ones that we probably, that's what you'd most associate with like drug use today. And of course, pills too, which uh, have kind of caught on in more, more recent years. Um, so Nixon gets the ball rolling on this and, and kind of a mind blowing thing to me is you, the federal government has scheduled drugs. There's schedule one, schedule two. Um, I don't know a whole ton, a lot about that, but basically if you're a schedule one drug, it essentially means that you, nobody should do it. It's going to have the stiffest penalties and there is no medical use for it. Uh, if you're a schedule two drug, it means, well, you're still going to have stiff penalties for it. You can't just have it and possess it, but that there is some medical purpose that could be attached to it. 
and kind of ironically, uh, heroin and cocaine are Schedule Two drugs, at least the last I heard, and marijuana is a Schedule One drug, which I think a lot of people would disagree with that today, and it wouldn't shock me if the federal government does some restructuring there because you know medical marijuana has caught on and many states have embraced that, whereas uh, most people I think would say cocaine doesn't really have a whole lot of medical purposes to it. Uh, but you know, you go back in history before the 1970s, go back to like the early 1900s, the Teddy Roosevelt era. Uh, there was a fact sheet I read off to you guys back in quarter one where, you know, at one time these were not regulated at all. You could actually go buy heroin or cocaine in liquid or powder versions just at your local pharmacy without a prescription. Now, I, it wasn't like an epidemic at that time. There weren't a uh, mass amounts of people that were cooking up shots of heroin and injecting. Uh, that hadn't really caught on to my knowledge that way yet, but it was available and easily accessible. And a lot of pharmacists actually recommended these drugs uh, as cures for a lot of different ailments. Uh, now, by the 1960s and 70s, there is an uptick in all drug use across the board. Uh, Americans are now exposed to like cannabis. They're more exposed to what psychedelics are. Uh, and then heroin and cocaine, they're going to crack down on those and really stiffen the penalties for those two, maybe for good reason, um, because these ones I think are a little bit more troubling. They're also highly addictive, whereas like psychedelics, not really addictive at all, I guess, from what I know about it. And then cannabis has no like physical dependency, but you can develop a mental dependency. These ones, heroin, cocaine, and honestly, alcohol too, all create a, can create a very strong physical dependence where you get withdrawals if you stop using it. Um, and they're just highly mentally addictive too, uh, where you're always chasing that high and you want to get that feeling back. Now, heroin has a uh, also ties into the Vietnam War, which we hadn't covered that yet. Uh, but if you watch the second interview I did with those Vietnam vets, they did get into it a little bit, like drug use uh, in the war. And, and those guys said that nah, the only thing they really did over there was like drink beer, but they all knew buddies that used uh, heroin and, and marijuana over in Vietnam. And that's an unintended consequence of the Vietnam War too, because heroin is easily accessible and dirt cheap over in places like Southeast Asia. Uh, that's where poppies and, you know, heroin comes from the, the opium poppy. Um, it, it, that's how you get it. You extract it from a plant and refine it down. Well, a lot of our soldiers over there were depressed. They didn't want to be there. They feel like, man, they could die any day. Uh, and going through all of that anxiety and turmoil and like the PTSD, a lot of them try to medicate themselves and make themselves feel better through using substances. Uh, well, heroin really catches on and there's an uptick and it becomes a very concerning thing with our, our servicemen over in Vietnam. Now, the vast majority of Vietnam veterans weren't using heroin, but a significant portion were. Uh, and actually, when those guys come back, a lot of them bring that addi addiction with them. Uh, and there's some very sad, tragic stories of these Vietnam veterans returning home and then they just can't get their life back on track and they become very dependent on, on heroin went over here. Also, the, the Vietnam veterans had told me that like, for what you could get over in Vietnam, it, the cost of buying it over in the United States, where we have law enforcement and we regulate this stuff, and there's stiff penalties for selling drugs like heroin, the cost went up tenfold. Uh, because again, just like back in the prohibition times, by making it banned and so you can't buy it legally, it, it creates a ton of risk and it creates a black market. Uh, there's, so there's more organized crime around it. The prices go up. Uh, you, it can be kind of shady with quality where you don't know really what you're getting. That's a major problem today uh, that most of the people that overdose on heroin, uh, it's not usually the heroin that gets them. It's the fentanyl it's cut with. Uh, that that is way too potent. And, uh, you know, you have some drug dealer mixing it up and trying to make his batch of heroin more potent and put in a little too much fentanyl. And that's usually what's leading to most of the ODs. Uh, so it's a huge uptick in the 60s and 70s. A lot of the Vietnam veterans, once they get back and if they can get their life on track and things get better, a lot of them, actually the majority of them, are able to get off heroin, but some of them are not able to. Uh, so that's something that gets associated with that Vietnam experience uh, where heroin and hard drug use gets kind of tied to it and associated with it. Now in the 1980s, there is, this is Nancy Reagan, Ronald Reagan, who was our president 
80s uh, his wife and she starts a big campaign i remember this when i was in elementary school it was called the just say no campaign um that's been criticized a lot and a lot of people say that that doesn't work and is not effective that actually you should educate people more um and not it, it, one of the big issues with it is it kind of lumps every single drug all together. Uh, and the thing is kind of like what I'm explaining through this PowerPoint, uh, the, the drugs are all kind of in separate categories. And I think a, probably a better way of looking at it is there are no good drugs and bad drugs. It's just there are these substances out there that affect humans and can have profoundly negative impacts, but they're all in different categories and they affect different people in different ways. And you should educate yourself and be extremely cautious. And I'm not endorsing using any of them, but I, you know what I mean? That that might be a more effective message than just saying all drugs are bad. Uh, you know, never use them because I think a flaw with the just say no campaign was a lot of kids like all drugs are bad when they're they're having that preached to them in elementary school then they get up older into their teenage years or 20s or go to college and maybe they're around somebody that smokes marijuana and they realize yeah that person's going to class getting their grades done their life isn't falling apart maybe if they're lying about marijuana being that dangerous maybe they're lying about all of them but honestly these drugs like and heroin are, are far riskier and have way more of a downside uh, than something like like a marijuana would. Okay, hopefully that makes sense. I'm trying to give you kind of a nuanced view of it. Uh, drug use does start to decline in the 90s, in the 2000s, but then in recent years, kind of in the last, like you know, kind of post 2000s, uh, 2005 on, there's been a very concerning up in pill usage, like Oxycontins, and in heroin again. Uh, so very concerning thing. Now, in the postmodern era, kind of the time period we're living in now, since you've been alive, uh, organized crime in America is fairly under control. I don't think we have any Al Capones going on. It's not like every city uh, in America has a, you know, a mafia organization, uh, but we do see a ton of... Uh, negativity with gang violence in cities that are controlling primarily turf to sell drugs. And then the situation in Mexico, from what I've researched about, it sounds like it's about out of control, uh, where these cartels down in Mexico are modern organized crime, and they can make bales of money, like up in the billions of dollars. And the primary source of their revenue is selling cocaine and heroin to Americans, right? Because we create a black market. Uh, so it's kind of like a very much a parallel to the times of prohibition, where an unintended consequence of banning alcohol was more organized crime. It didn't really affect the rates of people using it, uh, but it absolutely um, it, it, it absolutely led to a bigger black market in, in that issue where uh, people have to buy it illegally and it leads to more organized crime because there's a lot of risk in, in you know, moving it around and selling it. Uh, so recent years, huge spikes in usage and overdoses. A lot of that, like I said, is, is kind of due to the fentanyl. Uh, recently, there's been some pushes for decriminalization. And then uh, I'm going to do one other video here where I'm going to talk about some alternative solutions. Uh, so revisit my next video. That one, uh, I guess, is kind of optional, but I want to go over what two other countries in Europe have done to deal with the same spike in overdoses and heroin use in recent times. Um, and run some ideas by it, and, and that's going to tie into uh, today's Q&A response or journal entry. I haven't decided which one I'll be releasing it to. All right. Hopefully you found this informative. If you have any questions for me, by all means, shoot me an email and I will get back with you as soon as I can.